주캐나다 대사관 강사 시리즈를 시작하겠습니다. 대사관 강사 시리즈에 오신 것을 환영합니다. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. We will now begin this month's edition of Embassy Speaker Series. Please welcome Ambassador of the Republic of Korea to Canada, His Excellency Jo p i y o n g for the opening remarks. Good evening, the Honorable David k i l b o r and Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for your participation in the Embassy Speaker Series this evening. As you are well aware, uh, this year is a very special year for our both countries, uh, Canada and Korea. Uh, this year marks the 50th anniversary of different ties between our two countries and also 60th anniversary of Korean War Armistice. In addition, the Veteran Affairs Canada designated this year as the Year of Korean War Veteran. To, in honor of this uh, very special year, the Embassy uh, has planned a uh, speaker's series to share uh, the insights and perspectives of some of Canada's most prominent dignitaries uh, who have long been engaged in the various relations between our two countries. Tonight, I'm pleased to host the second event in this meaningful series. Uh, today's topic, the world's eyes on the Korean Peninsula, is both timely and relevant in the context of the current situation on the Korean Peninsula. We are both honored and privileged yeah, to have the Honorable uh, David k i l b o r as a guest speaker to share his own unique perspectives and insights the, with us. As we all know, the Mr. k i l b o r uh, spent uh, 27 years the serving the people of Canada as a, as a highly respected member of Parliament. His commitment and contribution have been recognized year after year in his various capacities within the parliament and the government. In the international community, uh, he is also praised and respected as long-time advocate uh, for peacekeeping and a strong voice for human rights and political reform in undemocratic societies. For us, for Korea, for Korean people, yeah, he has long been engaged in, in advance the, our special partnership yeah, between our two countries yeah, through his long career, while continuously supporting the peaceful reconciliation on the, on the Korean Peninsula. Without a doubt, the terrific job that he has done for our countries through his remarkable career has had uh, the paved the way for more constructive and strategic partnership uh, in the days ahead. Almost 10 years ago today, uh, Mr. k i l b o r g stood in front of the, an audience like this to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the different ties between our two countries. Uh, that time uh, was also uh, the time of high and great concern uh, toward North Korea uh, within the international community. To steal a quote uh, from his speech a decade ago, allowing the North to slip further into isolation would result in an even greater threat to security on the Korean Peninsula. and around the world. Indeed, even then, Mr. k i l b o r recognized the unique dynamic on the Korean Peninsula and its implications for Canada. So tonight, Mr. k i l b o r will once again reflect on the situation 
unfolding on the Korean Peninsula and share his thoughts on how to, on how the world should respond to it. Mr. Kilgore, uh, let me extend our deep appreciation uh, for your presence here tonight. I'm sure that all of us uh, will learn a great, a great deal yeah, from your perspective uh, on the challenges and the prospects uh, for the stability and peace on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, this is me, uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, shows I mean. Um, please don't laugh when I do this. Uh, Korean is a very hard language. Amin Hasei, E Jaria Ogi Disa Yang Huang Mida. The, uh, I, as you all have the text, I guess I can I, I can go through this very uh, quickly. And I, but I want to thank, before I say another word, uh, Dr. Chung for her work. Would you please raise your arm, Dr. Chung, wherever you're sitting? Because she has worked, uh, yes, yeah, she has worked mightily on this. If the photos go up at the right time, if uh, everything works, it's entirely because of her. her and I am responsible for anything that's said here tonight. She is not responsible for anything that's said <laughs> Please don't <laughs> blame her for anything you don't disagree with. Uh, I guess probably all of you know that we have, we should, Canada and Korea state share quite a lot of history. Uh, three people I mentioned in the first paragraph I think are particularly good examples. Oh, yes, I don't want to swallow that. Um, um, Luther Young, for example, who worked with Korean communities in Japan prior to the Second World War. John Scarth Gale, uh, who, uh, who created the Korean English Dictionary and translated numerous works uh, into Korean. And perhaps mostly do uh, Dr. Frank Schofield, whose support for Korean independence, the movement is recognized throughout the Korean Peninsula. Those individuals represent three pillars of what has become a far, a multi-pillar um, connection between our two countries and is growing, as, as His Excellency said, uh, all the time. Uh, Korean Canadians have brought much to this country, as you all know. A legendary work ethic. I understand Koreans work 29% uh, harder than Americans. I've read that, I think, in, uh, in a book. Uh, new businesses here. Uh, uh, and by the way, I see uh, Che Yoki at the back who, of the Korean Palace, uh, who I gather works seven days a week, ladies and gentlemen, from 10 in the morning until 10 at night, uh, 364 days a year. I believe she takes Christmas off. <laughs> That's the uh, work ethic in Canada. I met somebody yesterday who told me that the steel industry in, in um, Toronto, Montreal, is completely dominated by Korean welders because they're so good and they're so honest and they're so hardworking. So we all have, we probably all have our own stories about the work, the Korean work ethic, both here and in Korea. For about four in ten of the Koreans who come here from, uh, are headed a skilled category. Six in ten have backgrounds in vital computer and engineering fields. Students of all, Korean students want to come and study here. And this, is, I think, is particularly interesting. About 5,000 Canadians are teaching English in Korea now. How many of you have taught English in Korea? Could I ask you to raise your hands? Only two, three? Okay. Um, and so you and the people who are teaching there now are building long-term relationships with all things Korean. The bounds go way beyond the, the won and the dollar. The uh, people are both committed to universal values the inherent di dignity of each human being, the rule of law, the importance of the United Nations, another multilateral organization where we often have the same membership and the same goals. Uh, we believe in representative democracy to create freedom and opportunity and to work actively to promote it uh, at home and abroad. At a meeting of the uh, Community of Democracies, Your Excellency, uh, in Seoul in 2002, where I was very honored to, to be, then President Kim Dae Jung, Jung, I'm sorry, I had trouble with his, with his family name, gave a gripping speech. 
Many of you know that the late president paid a high price for his advocacy of democracy. He, was, uh, he walked with a limp until the end of his life because of injuries he received in the 70s from beatings. It's not surprising that our host told us at that meeting that the greatest achievement of the 20th century was helping democracy to uh, take root and spread across the planet. He noted, and I quote, out of 200 odd countries in the world, 140 have adopted multi-party multi system. This, he went on, this is significant progress considering the fact that only about 30 countries were rated as democracies up until the mid-70s, close quote. President Kim, who for me ranks with, with Aung San Suu Kyi, Nelson Mandela, Basra Pavel, and other human dignity icons, went on to say that in his mind, democracy is ne also necessary to achieve a, quote, transparent, fair, and viable market economy. And as I'm sure you all know, it was partly because of, of problems with the Korean economy that there were difficulties in 98, um, but because of, I think, some of his reforms, uh, democratic regulation and so on. Uh, Korea, South Korea bounced back uh, very quickly and uh, is now uh, part of its success story today. Another giant of the Republic is, is uh, Ban Ki-moon, uh, who I, somebody told me recently was actually taught as a young boy in a school that didn't have a roof. Is that well known by Koreans and accepted as true? It's amazing. Um, His Excellency uh, Noted when he was elected to the, be the Secretary General of the highest body on earth, in my view, quote, My heart is overflowing with gratitude towards my country and people who have sent me here to serve. It's been a long journey from my youth in war-torn and destitute Korea to this rostrum and these awesome responsibilities. I could make that the journey because the UN was with my people in our darkest days, close quote. And you all know that the Korean War was a continuous nightmare, taking the lives of almost three million people on both sides. Canadian soldiers, uh, 30,000 of them were fighting as peacemakers for the UN. 516 of our fellow citizens uh, are buried in Korea. Um, uh, Seoul was, I believe, captured two, twice, three times by different sides, and so Seoul was a complete disaster. Uh, when I was there a month or so ago, I met uh, Mr. Nam Sang, who operates what I believe, I'm told is the largest restaurant, Chinese restaurant in, uh, in Asia. Seats uh, 1,300, 130 staff. Do you know how he started his work? His, uh, his family had been devastated by the war. He was 10 years old when he managed to get to Seoul. Uh, two of his brothers, by the way, had died from eating pine tree needles to try to survive. Mr. Nam started working in this restaurant at the age of 10 from 4 in the morning until 1 in the morning uh, for 20 years. And I believe he worked every day for 20 years in that restaurant. And now he's, uh, now he's got a room at the side of the restaurant or a building where you can go and see a portrait of him or pick a photograph of him with every, every you probably, your portrait is probably there too. He's got thousands of paintings of portraits. Uh, anyway, that's maybe typical of, of uh, the, the work ethic and the difficulty people surmount in Korea. Korea today, the government, as you said, sir, has proclaimed 2013 the year of Korea and Canada. So much is going so well in South Korea that it appears to be an example of rapid human development for the entire world. It's democracy, including the election of Mrs. Park um, Gun Hae, as the first woman president, governance in general, uh, strong economy, education helped by very, very uh, committed parents. Do we call them tiger parents? Is that a fair comment? Um, I, uh, economy, the, the culture, arts, sports, all seem today to be among the very best internationally. Even the dance, and I'm going to get this wrong, a Gangnam style. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing um, But get this, attracted more than 1.5 billion YouTube views. That's the, the website's most watched video ever. How many of you have seen it? <laughs> Anybody not seen it? <laughs> that was, okay. Um, let me offer an, uh, an assistant. Well, I'm actually, I'm giving you that example about Mr. Nam and his restaurant. Uh, I'll get that. 
Now, the current crisis. Oh, yeah. If you like those photographs, the person who found them. <laughs> Did you choose this one here at the end? <laughs> uh, um, is that an example of a bad haircut? <laughs> no, I, I'm not going to say that. Uh, when Korea was divided at the end of the war, the North was, of course, administered by Moscow, the South by Washington. Authors Asimoglu and Robinson of Why Nations Fail note that uh, for two generations of Kim family, absolutism has done to the residents of the North, and it, it included living standards by the late 90s about one-tenth of the ones in the South. Life expectancy of 10 years less than in the South. Recurring famines because of frequent collapses in agricultural production. And an educational system, which as I'm sure you, most of you know, much of which is propaganda intended to promote the legitimacy of the regime against self-appointed enemies. After which students, and I believe it's men and women, spend 10 years in the army. Is it women too? Both women and men have to do that. Uh, Nina Shea of Freedom House wrote a couple of days ago that the Kim dynasty has waged a 50-year war on religion. I quote her, Nina, In the early 60s, Buddhist shrines and temples and Christian churches were shuttered. Religious leaders were either executed or sent to concentration camps. Pyongyang was known in the 50s as Asia's Jerusalem for its robust Christian communities. But the five Christian churches that now exist, all in the capital, are state-operated for international propaganda purposes, close quote. Ian Shea of Freedom House. Professor Ian Baruma of Bard College in New York describes the regime as, regime as essentially, quote, a theocracy, some elements are borrowed from Stalinism and Maoism, but much of the Kim cult owes more to the indigenous forms of shamanism. Human gods have promised salvation. Baruma adds that the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 90s was a disaster for North Korea when its, when its aid stopped, leaving it almost totally dependent on, the, on China. China, Baruma adds, quote, could crush North Korea in a day just by cutting off of food and, and fuel, close quote. But from the very beginning to the South, institutions encouraged investment and trade. Its first elected president, uh, President Singman and Park, were clearly autocratic. They both helped to build an export market economy. Full representative democracy did develop over the decades. The 50 uh, million residents of South Korea today live in the world, one of the world's largest, most successful economies. Uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, it became the world's eighth largest exporter. So in conclusion, and I hope that there'll be time for comments and questions afterwards, uh, please don't hold back. This is a very democratic place we're here, we are here tonight. How should the world respond to the recent events in the Korean Peninsula? It was my privilege, as I say, to visit South Korea twice in the last a month or so, and, and like in October. Uh, by the way, do you know what the population of Greater Greater Seoul is? They say it's 10 million, but am I not correct that in fact Greater Seoul is 25 million? Is that too high? <laughs> you, know, you don't want to agree. not agree. Do not agree with that. That's what they told me. Many people told me that in Seoul. Anyway, um, the UN, NATO, and the world's democracies must respond immediately if the North insanely again to invade the South. Kim Jong-un and his group in Pyongyang, are, if they're convinced that outsiders will respond in kind to any large-scale violence, as they will, they are highly unlikely to risk their survival and privileges. I agree with those who think that the likelihood of North Korea attacking South Korea remains small, despite all the incendiary rhetoric coming from Kim since January. He's no doubt seeking to convince North Koreans that he's defending them against uh, aggression from foreign enemies. Without external foes, he lacks any legitimacy. Actually, my wife Laura pointed that out. She's absolutely right. How many North Koreans, despite decades of similar propaganda from his father and grandfather, can believe that the UN sanctions are, are somehow an act of aggression? The joint South Korea U.S. military exercises have been occurring for years and are hardly acts of war. 
The larger danger, of course, is that the regime will implode, provoking unmanageable regional consequences, possibly including intervention from the south. That would greatly trouble Pyongyang's only important remaining ally in Beijing, which wants North Korea to remain a buffer against American military influence in the region, and worries about millions of North Korean refugees flooding into China. The regime in the north is seeking to shake South Korean resolve to bluff Seoul into concessions to appease the tantrums out of Pyongyang. Perhaps South Koreans should just uh, keep their powder dry, be prepared for anything, but don't offer anything until there's agreement to abandon nuclear weapons and return to the status quo ante. Ron Mickelberg, one of the world's best reporters in my view, the other day listed some of the indicators that Beijing is considering distancing itself from Pyongyang. He quoted Earl Drake, uh, some of his former colleagues are here today, I'm happy to see, the former Canadian ambassador to China, saying that his contacts in Beijing, when North Korea comes up in confrontation, I mean, I quote, sigh and tell me we simply don't know how to deal with them. They're wild men, close quote. Former Asia, East Asia diplomat uh, Gordon Holden, my friend Gordon Holden, now of China Institute University of Alberta, provided a list of indicators. Allowing the North to slip further into isolation could result in much greater threat on the peninsula around the world, I believe. Eric Weingartner, and I'm very sorry that he's not here tonight, one of Canada's best experts on North Korea, has suggested that beyond security concerns, South Korea's approach is driven by a desire to enable North Korea to develop its own economy to a point where unification would be possible. One reason why the temperature of recent events has escalated to its current level, I believe, is because of a mutual lack of understanding among the key players. Are people misreading each other's signals in much the same way that occurred during the Cuban Missile Crisis in the Vietnam War? Ultimate negotiating positions could be surprisingly compatible. Both countries are not really engaging, largely because of the history of hostility, deep mutual distrust, and lack of communication and understanding that characterizes the relationship. Among the many shared values between Canadians and Koreans, um, perhaps the greatest is our joint desire to see lasting peace, dignity, and human security for all peoples. Our mutual respect has drawn us together in the past, and I have no doubt that through growing cooperation, it will continue to grow in the future. It's the unpredictability of the new and young leader that is so worrisome. Wishing to avoid escalating tensions is no doubt why President Obama has not commented, to my knowledge, on the crisis in the past while. Although, he is, as you am sure you know, he's assured South Korea that, that he would come to their, its defense. Secretary John Kerry is optimistic from his three-nation visit, as you all have read and heard. He's hoping that Beijing will help to rid the Korean Peninsula of nuclear weapons. We all hope and pray that this proves sound. It was certainly troubling when Kim's government asked foreign governments to leave, um, take their diplomats out of Pyongyang, telling Britain, for example, he could not guarantee their safety. Both Seoul and Washington say they have seen no signs of that the regime is preparing for an attack on South Korea. Marathon runners from 16 nations competed earlier this week in Pyongyang. The world can only hope and pray that sanity in the region will prevail. Kamsa Hamida. Is it is actually right to make some correct comments. Oh, we just have His Excellency from Nigeria. Welcome. Do you want to come and speak? No, he gives some of the best speeches I've ever heard. What do you want to say? I was, I know when I was in Seoul some years ago as Transport Minister of the country. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Hi. Oh, please, what's your name? Please, come so, uh, thank you, Honorable David Kilborn. Uh, we'll now proceed to the Q&A session. If you have any questions for our speaker today, 
please raise your, raise your hand and one of us will uh, bring a mic to you and you may introduce yourself and pose the question. I, I'm sure this is going to be a tough question. Sure, go ahead. Uh, I'm just wondering how much um, do you consider some of the Beijing would encourage North Korea to disarm? Is that, is that, I'm just wondering, um, it always seems that it's kind of convenient for uh, the Chinese regime that they've got this crazy neighbor and uh, they tend to avoid getting pressure directly on some of their um, uh, support for North Korea and their history of support. I just want your perspective on that situation. Well, somebody I know who I believe told me not very long ago that if, if North Koreans managed to get across the river into China, which is extremely difficult, you, you saw the photographs of the soldiers, women wearing high heels this week or last week in the paper. I'm told that what happens is that these refugees are asked in China whether, where they were planning to get to. If they say Canada or Nigeria, it's, I believe it's recorded in green ink on their refusals to allow them to stay in China. If they say they were trying to get to South Korea, he told me, it's done in another color ink, perhaps blue. And these people are then returned to North Korea, and he tells me, and I believe he knows, uh, that the ones who, who said they wanted to get to South Korea are immediately executed. If they wanted to get to Canada, I guess they just go to jail for 20 years. If anyone knows that that story is true or not true, I'd be very happy if you correct the record, because I, I believe it is true. I see someone, a professor, an expert at the back. Uh, Simon, do you want to say something about that? You were the, you were the chair of the, East, the Asian Studies uh, last year. Where is he sitting? Oh, yeah, sorry, Simon. Please come. Please come. You make a comment. Well, thank you very much for this uh, talk. Uh, I'm sure you've been looking at other parts of the world as well. So. Um, do you think that this will have any impact on maybe, say, Japanese uh, security policy in the area? I think, do we have somebody from Japan here? I think so. I saw on the list of some, maybe some of the Japanese embassy. Is he or she here? But please come, come forward. <laughs> 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 We're a very democratic guy. <laughs> uh, these diplomats. <laughs> well, I guess I better not go there. Eh? Uh, why, don't you, why don't you want to make a comment, Simon? You've got, you want to make say, say something more? No, you listen. You've spent how many years studying uh, studying in uh, that part of the world? I spent two years in China and eight years in Taiwan and studied Japanese in Japan. So yeah, I think that qualifies. Please make a comment. Yeah, so I'm just uh, very you know very happy that you brought this to our attention and that we're talking about recent events and. It could be interesting to hear perhaps some words from the embassy here with if they have any insight. I, I tried. Yeah. <laughs> any inside, um, insights on this issue? Where's Dr. Chang? She's left the room. Maybe she would she like would you like to say something? Uh, your 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 boss doesn't want to say anything. You want to say something? I don't know. <laughs> okay, no, I I won't that. Okay, any, anybody else? We statements would be much more, more warmly received than questions, but so go ahead. Do uh, you want to say something? Please, please, please say something. This man, I kid you not, ladies and gentlemen, he can stir my blood in about 30 seconds of speaking. Please come up. He's a former foreign minister of Nigeria for how many years? And he's going to, every ministry you can hold, he's held it. Well, David, since you insist, uh, just to say that uh, when I visited Seoul, uh, this must have been 2002. I was transport minister of my country, Nigeria, and uh, had me to my, my uh, colleague, the uh, transport minister himself. Uh, I, I was amazed with the tremendous uh, feat uh, that country had achieved. Um, I, of course, my knowledge of the war. Korean Peninsula. As we came down to the ancient airport, ancient as event, uh, my mind kept playing back how that battle must have been fought. Uh, and uh, it was quite exciting. The only problem I had with the visit was that it was too short. <laughs> so I promised myself to come back. And I did when the 
the Republic of Korea hosted a very impressive uh, global conference on, on e-governance. And I was amazed about the use of e-technology to drive governance. And I came back and reported to the President of Nigeria that is the, the model in, in the Republic of Korea is something Nigeria should look at very closely. And we have been doing that in many areas. A lot of big uh, business groups from the Republic of Korea in my country, we are partnering with them on a number of issues. The final thing I'd like to say is that because Nigeria had been through a civil war, and indeed, I fought in that war as a young officer on the Biafran side, the eastern part of Nigeria. We are very sensitive about conflicts anywhere in the world. So we join all peace-loving people all over the world to pray for peace on the Korean Peninsula, to hope that diplomacy will prevail over brute force. That's the question of my government. Thank you very much for that. That's probably a very good note to end on. Does somebody want to see if they can run up the uh, uh, former foreign minister from Nigeria? P please don't pull back. Somebody, yes, please call up. Andy, yeah. Andy, I lived in Korea for a few years, came back here about 10 years ago. One of the things that I thought was constructive and encouraging at the time was the uh, family reunification, the family reunions that were being organized. I think the joint was the president at the time. And uh, it, it was uh, tangible evidence that uh, there was some warming going on, and the visits went both ways, from the south to their families in the north. Mind you, screen very much. So my question really, and I don't know who has the answer, but uh, I hope that somebody does, is have those continued, or have they been stopped? And if they were stopped, uh, when were they stopped? You're, you're <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly don't know the answer. I'm sorry. I think everything is stopped. The, 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 yeah. the park, is, the industrial park, has been closed by the north. A hundred thousand people were working in that park. The, you mean the casing industry? Yes, yes, the industrial park. It's, it's and uh, now that uh, fifty-five thousand, uh, fifty-five thousand North Koreans are working with a Korean businessmen there. Yeah. So, but it's all been stopped. Is it? What a week ago or two weeks ago? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a North Korea's decision. Yeah. I want to make one point, your point, Simon, about uh, I was in Japan, in fact, I was on my way to North Korea uh, uh, in 2002 when they fired another missile, and, and our foreign minister at the time went actually they said I should not go to Nagoya. But one of the things I discovered in Tokyo is that resentment in Japan is very, very deep. Particularly, it seems, about the people who were literally on their way home from school and were kidnapped and were taken on submarines to North Korea, and they've never heard from again, some of them. And I, do you know how many people were kidnapped in Japan? I, I heard a figure, but I've forgotten what it was. Is it, is it, is it 100 or less than 100? Well, we guess so. But, but I think the Japanese diplomat. <laughs> I'm trying to get one of your diplomats to come up here. How, how many? How many? Nice cases are maybe uh, 20 or 20. 20. But we don't know. Uh, uh, exactly. uh, we don't know exactly uh, what that number is because okay. there are some suspicious cases. But, uh, oh. uh, the point that His Excellency made about having lived through the Biafran War, which is a pretty ghastly thing too, and the fact that you know, during when you agree to basically try to forget from each other and put it behind you. Yep. And the fact that a Biafran young officer could now be serving as the foreign minister of his country and high commissioner to Canada is, is a, I think, is a very encouraging sign. Okay, yes, if you've got a statement, you can get up, sir. If you've got a question, please ask uh, high commissioner from Nigeria. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
thank you for it, but David, that this type of, of uh, seizures uh, personally touched me because I came from the same situation of South and North Yemen. So I lived my, my childhood, I lived my, my youth as from one part of the country, which is the South. And now I'm living in a country which is called Yemen, South and North. And we have the same story of the only country now. We have South and North Korea. And that's why whatever you are saying while I'm here, it's really touched me emotionally because we spent years of, of division between South and North, and we have discovered that radio were wrong, and we have to come back together as one country. And what I can see, like now within the next five, ten years, that will be part of the history of South and North Korea. I had the opportunity to visit uh, South Korea in my uh, former position. I met with most of the officials. I felt really it's a matter of time for South and North Korea to come back together. And that's why I thank you for, uh, for uh, Honorable David, for excellency of having these kind of sessions. And as a Koreans, and most of the South and Koreans here, they will see like, they feel like how much they are tortured of having all these kind of statements coming from the North or from the South. But you just calm down. It's a matter of time. It's naturally, this is politics. But time will come to realize you that to all of you, you have to come together. And things is moving or changing. In fact, uh, like, it cannot continue to be the same thing. It's a matter of time, even the North Koreans, time will come for, the, for them to realize that they have to come back with their brothers and sisters in South. And from your side, as, as a South Koreans, just you have to extend your hands. No wars, it's enough of wars. We have, we have gone with the first war, we have gone with the second uh, world war, and we, have, we know what was the results. Results is always disaster, and that's why we need, we need this uh, peaceful, nation and peaceful world in fact and South Koreans it's something that's in their hand to keep that that region and in, in, in the peninsula of Korea come by just keeping uh, the dialogue and I think there is a very good statement here for the North Koreans that they, they are coming back to a dialogue and they are ready to, 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 to negotiate and that's the best thing for all of, of all the peninsula to come back for, for this kind of dialogue. Thank you very much. Uh, but if I may, I'm not passing the buck. I see Senator High No here. But originally, he was a diplomat for, for Vietnam, and he's recently become a, a senator, and he was, I gather, an outstanding citizenship judge. Hi, uh, we've worked together on issues for a long time. Would you like, being from South Vietnam, would you like to add something to what we just heard? He, he, I've never seen him at a loss of words in the 25 years that we've known each other. Okay, thanks, David. I'm going to give my two cents. Uh, I, I don't agree with you. I don't agree with, with, with all of you. I'm also from the South. Vietnam also divided by two, right? The North is communist, the South is free world. When you have the, uh, what you say, times to get together, we have how many years now? The North invades South Vietnam with the support from the Russia and China. They took over Vietnam since 75. Now, 2013, nearly 40 years, still communist. You do not, you don't have a democratic freedom and democracy in Vietnam since 75. So, my two cents is, well, the reason China is not going to do anything because they will use North Korea as their public chip to put pressure in Asia. That's two. To bargain with South Korea, to bargain with Australia and Japan because those are the two countries where they have economy that are, if not better than China. That's their bargaining chip. They keep using it as long as they can control so that Korea, South Korea, I'm not talking about North Korea, there's no use. South Korea, Japan cannot, uh, how do you call it, uh, develop more or surpass China in the economy, in trade, and so on. 
That's the value chips. They don't want to control it. They use them as security threat. So you have to see, to concede the demands of China. If you go back, China already claimed some islands belong to China. They tried to bargain with the Philippines, uh, with Indonesia, with Vietnam, even Vietnam is under their influence. And now they're trying to have also a negotiation with Australia. So uh, time will come, but I think uh, as long as you have a communist country controlled by another communist country, it's very rare that you're going to be united to be a democratic freedom and democracy. Thank you. Is there somebody here who's a former diplomat for, for Canada in, uh, in Korea? Robert Collette, can you see, did he come in? He in there? How about then uh, the president of the Canada Korea Association come up and speak? <laughs> I didn't expect that I'll be suddenly called upon uh, in front of all this uh, very distinguished uh, guests for tonight. Uh, the other one, David Kregel, we have known each other and worked together for many, many, many years, and you uh, were greatly um, supporter for the uh, Korean issue as well as um, Canada-Korea bilateral relations, and you were uh, Korea's uh, best friend. And uh, so I really appreciate what we have done. And also we are a member of the uh, Canada-Korea Society's uh, Advisory Council. We launched the ninth and happy years ago in the Canadian Senate with uh, co chair with at that time, Senate Speaker Ben Hayes. Now, tonight, uh, the focus is current situation, um, what's happening in vis a -vis North Korea and the world. And uh, uh, I'm not really expert in that, but although I follow very closely, and in fact, uh, I will be one of our panelists uh, next weekend at the Mount Center Conference at the University of Toronto uh, with my husband, who was first the uh, Canadian uh, Trade Commissioner. Uh, resident trade commission who went uh, in 1973 and opened the trade office. So it's a long time coming. Uh, my interest is that the, of course, uh, you know, I was watching in the internet that a lot of dialogue uh, happening in Korea with the very uh, renowned, the distinguished uh, scholars in Korea. Why Kim Jong Un? is doing what he's doing. Doesn't he know uh, what will happen if he, indeed he provoked? He knows very well what will happen, but there must be some reason. So it really interested me. Why? Because I was born during the Korean War. I grew up with all this. And in fact, uh, years ago, when I met uh, through my husband, the first uh, uh, Chinese uh, diplomat and delegation came in Montreal. I thought, uh, oh my goodness, they are communists. You know, my reaction was really, since then we had many uh, uh, overseas postings in Yugoslavia and whatnot. Uh, we in South, we grew up with that kind of also doctrine, thinking that the communist was a red face and full horn and, you know, that kind of concept. It was propaganda growing up in Korea in my Time. Now, whole world has been changed, so I really feel we are living in a uh, world of family in a way. It will be my subject, my talk uh, later on, but uh, many uh, ambassadors uh, have spoken today. I really appreciate uh, I think we are so closely networked, and it, the world is changing so rapidly. And North Korea problem is not only North and South Korean issue. It's a world issue. And it's a Canada's issue. And this year, as ambassador, I really appreciate the ambassador's initiative of this dialogue series because it was unprecedented. In fact, uh, 
many, I have known many, many Korean ambassadors. <laughs> He's really gung ho on this, so uh, that's wonderful. But we take time to actually visit ourselves. What are we trying to do? And in one, actually, some one commentator said that Kim Jong Un, the all this provoking rhetoric and all this thing, he knows very well what he's doing. He calculated, he designed. It's nothing just happened. So what did he achieve? He achieved that indeed he is the leader. Yes. Now nobody knew before. Everybody was doubting that uh, you know, is he really in charge? Somehow he wanted to put down his foot that yes, I am in charge. Number two, he wanted to let whole world know that the they are the nuclear you know country. So either rightfully or wrongfully, or you know, I don't know what level of uh, nuclear uh, power they do have. Doesn't matter. He used the media. He used the rhetoric. He used the scare. He used the whatever the the thing is. So he achieved what he set out to achieve. So he's a succeeding, you know. So are we all, you know, played? scared and what's going to happen and all kinds of things, this, you know, ups and downs, all this uh, emotional thing. So I think that we all uh, uh, need to sort of compose ourselves, where are we heading, you know. And uh, I, um, I admire so far the South Koreans are very uh, precise and uh, taking charge sort of uh, uh, initiative rather than scaring their, you know, uh, national people and so on. But I also, of course, like the Honorable David Kribble mentioned, that, that the unpredictability is the, uh, the point. So I don't want to take any more time. I'm very sorry to, to get this, uh, you know, uh, but I really appreciate and I think we all can play uh, one small role in, in bringing this issue into this really focusing towards the world, uh, world of peace. Thank you. No, 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 I'm just getting up. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I uh, come from the uh, former Yugoslavia, and there are lots of virtual divides in there, so uh, I know pretty much what uh, the South Korean and North Korean people are facing. What everyone usually forgets is that democracy takes time, and uh, you know when North Korea is ready to uh, face democracy, they'll they'll go to the bargaining table and they'll uh, do something. But right now, like all we need to wait for is that time to elapse. It only takes like one person in the uh, organization to change something, and um, as long as the olive branch from South Korea is still there, I think that. Um, It'll be only a uh, positive, positive result in the future. Thank you. Thank you. That was very well said. Thank, thank you for making that point. Uh, en français, on dit avec de la patience, tout est possible. Okay. Oh, yeah, please, please. One. Yes. Mrs. Cole. One last comment. You get the last word. Okay. I just want to say one thing that I never thought in my generation that I would see what Gorbachev did. So I'm just going to say one word. Hope is alive. Because you can see what Gorbachev achieved. It, we all thought in my generation that never East and West Germany could meet, that the wall would go down. So we just have to be patient and continue with hope in our hearts every day and never let it go. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Honorable David Kilgore, His Excellencies, and distinguished guests for providing us with the wonderful insight. Uh, we will now present our honored uh, speaker today with a commemorative plaque and uh, proceed to a brief photo session.
Please, 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 each of your chairs. Uh, the last page is an Embassy Speaker Series survey. Um, if you could take a moment to fill them out. Uh, we have pens just outside the door and just leave it on our reception desk. That would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Yeah. And we have uh, prepared a dinner reception in the hall, so please join us uh, for further discussion with the speaker and our guests today. Thank you very much.